for this session, we are to talk about your employee benefits, which is covered under IAS 19 or PAS 19. So under PAS 19, of course, it provides us for the accounting of your employee benefits, which are your uh, short-term employee benefits, your long-term employee benefits, your other long-term benefits, and then your termination benefits. However, under PAS 19 or employee benefits, particularly for this session, we will place our focus into your uh, post-employment benefits, which is considered a long-term benefit. So just like your previous standards that we have discussed, your post-employment benefits or your PAS 19 provides for a mixed account. So we have your net defined asset or net defined liability. So for today, we need to know when can we recognize net defined asset and when can we recognize net defined liability. But before that, let's look into our topics or our intended learning outcomes. So our intended learning outcomes for today, first, we need to distinguish between accounting for the employer's defined contribution plan and defined benefit plan. So later, we will learn that there are two types of your uh, post-employment benefits, that is your defined contribution and defined benefit. After that, we need to identify the types of pension plans and their characteristics as to this contribution and defined benefit plan. Next, we explain how to measure the pension obligation. So when we talk about your pension obligation, this pension obligation talks about your benefit or your contribution. Next, we need to list the components of your pension expense. So if you remember, one item in your OCI is your uh, the measurements, gains, or losses under your defined benefit plans. So if you still remember, uh, under your pension expenser form, now we will learn about the measurements of your uh, gains or losses under your defined benefit plan. So when we talk about your pension expense later, we talk about your pension expense that is presented under profit or loss and a a component of your pension expense, which is presented under your OCI. Finally, we describe the requirements for reporting your employee benefits. Let's start by first talking into your employee benefits. Your employee benefits, just like uh, any other standard, is not straightforward. So when we say it's not straightforward, it does not provide for an actual definition of what is an employee benefit. So just like any other type of standard, it mentions or enumerates some employee benefits. So employee benefits was defined by your standard by enumerating the different types of employee benefits. So under this, we have your different types of employee benefits. We have your short-term benefits, such as your different wages and your salaries. We also have your post-employment benefits. We have your defined benefit plan and your defined contribution plan. You have your other long-term benefits. We have your long-term service leave or any other long-term benefits which gives more than 12 months of benefits. And then we have your termination benefits, which uh, you know as, uh, which is very prevalent nowadays due to the different closures in business, they are given uh, termination packages. So these termination packages are known as your termination benefits. So again, when we talk about your employee benefits under PAS 19, it is these items. First, short-term benefits. Then we have your post-employment benefits. We have your other long-term benefits. When we talk about short-term benefits, normally we have your less than 12 months benefit. So some are your wages, uh, your salaries, we have your service incentive leave, we have your vacation leave, we have your sick leave, anything that is less than 12 months as to your benefits. Post-employment benefit is generally a long-term benefit because it is a benefit given after the employment. So normally you know this one as your pensions. Your other long-term benefits are other long-term except post-employment benefits. So 
other benefits except post-employment benefits are your other long-term benefits. And of course, termination benefits are your employee benefits given at the time of your termination of employer-employee relationship. We start first with your short-term benefits. So what is a short-term benefit? A short-term benefit are those benefits that are expected to be settled only before 12 months after the end of your annual reporting period during which employee services are rendered but do not include termination benefits. Because generally, termination benefit is also a short-term benefit. It is payable within 12 months. However, under IAS 19, you already know termination benefit is a separate benefit or employee benefit from your short-term benefits. Therefore, although termination benefit is considered short-term, it is a separate category. Therefore, it should not be included in your short-term benefits. So what are the examples again? We have your vacation leave, we have your sick leave, we have your wages, we have your salaries. Okay, so for your short-term benefits, generally, we have here your compensated absences or your different leave with pay. Okay, so generally, when you take a leave during your employment but is still payable, meaning you still earn while on leave or while being absent, we call that compensated absences. So these are absences which employees will be paid even though they are absent. Remember the rule in your employment, the rule in your employment is that no work, no pay. However, in your comp compensated absences, even if you don't have work, you have pay because they are compensated, such as these types of leaves. So if there is a short-term benefit such as this, we need to recognize our expense and our liability. So we have your uh, debit, your employee benefit expense. And we credit your short-term employee account that you want to credit depending on your chart of accounts. So as long as you have employee, employee benefit liability, whether that is a short-term employee benefit, what type of uh, benefit, whether it is vacation, sick, or sabbatical, you can credit any liability account to show that compensated absences. For your compensated absences, therefore, you will uh, decrease your liability once the compensated absence was already uh, taken or used by the employee. So, for example, you have a service incentive leave of five days, five days. Normally, service incentive leaves or leaves can either be uh, uh, used or it can be converted into your cash payment. So if ever it is used, then you remove now your liability and you uh, debit your liability, you credit your cash payment. So if ever it is still cash paid, then you debit your liability and you credit your cash. So why do we still credit cash whether it is used or converted into cash? Because still you need to pay your employee whether or not it is used or it will be uh, monetize okay you will still pay the employee whether or not it is used or monetized if it's used take note you are absent you will still be paid therefore the payment represents the cash payment credit and then if it's monetized whether or not you use it if it is monetized you will still pay the employee so what's the difference between it is used and it is monetized if it's used as a, uh, as a compensation on your no work, you use your SIL. If it's monetized, you still work. At the same time, you have your monetization of your SIL. So it's like a double amount because you still work. At the same time, you still have your SIL that is monetized. Next, you have your profit sharing or bonus payment. So this is another short-term benefit. Remember, we have already discussed this one in your estimated liabilities under your bonus payable or your profit sharing payable. So uh, we will recognize your profit sharing or bonus payments 
when there is an expected profit sharing and bonus payment. Generally, we look if ever we have legal or constructive obligation rings a bell that is past 37. We recognize a liability based if ever we have legal obligation or a constructive obligation. So this one is part of your different estimated liabilities that we have discussed before. So as you can see, we still debit your expense and we credit a liability. So generally, in your short-term benefits, what is the entry? Debit, expense, credit, a liability. Next type of employee benefit, we have your post-employment benefits. And we said we will place our emphasis on your post-employment benefits. Why? Because out of the different employee benefits, what are the different employee benefits? Again, short-term post-employment benefits, other long-term benefits, and your termination benefits. These three items, your short-term, other long-term, and termination benefits, generally your entry is a debit to expense and a credit to liability. This is straightforward. Whatever is the amount of your benefit, that is the amount of your expense and your liability. That's how we will measure it. However, in your post-employment benefit, it differs depending on the type of your post-employment benefit plan. So what is a post-employment benefit? In a post-employment benefit, we have either formal or informal arrangements where an entity provides a post-employment benefit to one or more employees. So examples are your retirement benefits, your life insurance, and your medical care. So under Pass 19, we have two types of your employment benefits or post-employment benefits. We have your defined contribution plan and we have your defined benefit plan. So under your defined contribution plan, what is defined here in your plan is the amount of your contribution. So for example, you will provide yearly 300,000 pesos under your plan. So you as the employer, you have a defined contribution to the plan. You will place 300,000 each year. Clear? So in a defined contribution plan, what do we have here? We have a fixed contribution. So what is defined is the contribution. Now, based on your total contribution, it depends now if ever what is the amount of the benefit given to the employee. But what is defined here is the amount of your contribution. Take note, you have no legal or constructive obligation to make further payments in case you do not have sufficient assets to pay for your employment benefits. Because so long as you do your contribution, you always pay your contribution, then the set is already done. You do not need to pay future amounts. However, in your defined benefit plan, what is defined here is the benefit. So for example, if your defined benefit is 1 million, you must pay that benefit of 1 million to the employee. So what if your fund is not enough because, of course, your contributions will go to the fund and your liability is the amount of the benefit. So what if your fund is not enough? You need to provide more fund to meet that benefit. So unlike in your defined contribution, you do not have legal or constructive obligation to make further payments. Here, you make your further payments so that you can meet the amount of our benefit. And also, we have here actuarial and investment trees. So what is this actuarial or investment trees? So in your actual trees, that is the amount of your risk as to the measurement of your defined benefit. So you have a problem as to the measurement of your benefit here. So we have different actuarial assumptions as to the amount of your benefit. Then Whatever is the risk on your actuarial, so your gains or losses, we account for that. However, in your defined contribution, we do not look into your benefit. What we look into is your contribution. Therefore, there is no actuarial risk here, but in defined benefit, there is an actuarial risk. So again, in defined contribution, no legal or constru constructive obligation as to the amount of your post-employment benefit because what is defined is the amount of contribution. While in your defined benefit plan, you have an amount 
that is to be given to your employee. Therefore, you have illegal or constructive obligation. And another is since you are looking into the amount of your benefit, there is an actuarial risk. Risk after the amount of your benefit because you need to meet that amount of benefit. So in your defined contribution, no actuarial risk, but in defined benefit, there is an actuarial risk. Let's go now into the accounting of your defined contribution and accounting of your defined benefit. So we start first with your accounting for defined contribution. So how do we account for your defined contribution plans? To account for your defined contribution plans, it is quite straightforward. So it is more likely than your different types of your employee benefits. You just need to debit an expense and you credit cash for your cash payment. This cash payment represents the amount of your contribution. Take note, there is no liability here. Therefore, always a cash payment on your amount of your contribution to the plan. That's how we will account for your defined contribution plans. Because again, we just need to pay for our contributions. How about in a defined benefit plan? In a defined benefit plan, we have the following steps to account for it. First, we need to determine the deficit or surplus. Next, we need to determine the defined liability or defined asset based on your deficit or surplus. And lastly, we need to determine the components of your defined benefit cost. As we said, this pension expense, we have two items to be presented. So the benefit cost to be presented in your profit or loss and the benefit cost to be presented under your other comprehensive income. So let's now start accounting for your defined benefit plan. First accounting is the determination of deficit or surplus. So we need to determine the deficit or surplus. So how do we determine the deficit or surplus? To determine the deficit or surplus, we need to get for the present value of defined benefit obligation and the fair value of your plan assets. So what is your present value of defined benefit obligation? The present value of your defined ben benefit obligations is equal to this amount. So present value of defined benefit obligation is also known as your PVDBO. So based on your present value of defined benefit obligation, we compare it to your fair value of plan assets. If the present value of defined benefit obligation is greater than your fair value of plan assets, we have a deficit. If your present value of defined benefit obligation is lesser than your fair value of plan assets, we have your surplus. Take note, your fair value of plan assets talks about your different contributions and your defined benefit obligation talks about your employee benefit. So if your employee benefit is greater than your contributions, it means that your contributions or your assets is not enough to cover your employee benefits. Then we have a deficit. But if your contributions is greater than your present value of defined benefit obligation, it means we have a surplus of assets. So next question here is, how do we compute for your present value of defined benefit obligation or PVDBO? And how do we compute for your fair value of plan assets or FVPA? To compute for your PVDBO, first we have your beginning balance. Then we have your current service cost. So what is this current service cost? This current service cost is the amount of your employee service for the current year. So whatever is the employee service for the current year, we include here. Next, you have your past service cost. Your past service cost is the amount of your employee service in the past that is now amortized during the year. Next, we have your interest cost. This interest cost is known as your uh, amount of interest based on your beginning defined benefit obligation. So beginning PVDBO multiplied by your interest rate, that is amount of your interest cost. So any benefits paid, of course, will decrease your defined benefit obligation. Actuarial loss is presented on the credit side and actuarial gain is presented on your 
debit side. So why is actuarial loss on the credit side? There is an actuarial loss if ever the amount of your obligation increases. Amount of obligation increases, there is an actuarial loss. Actuarial gain if your amount of obligation will decrease. Okay, so take note, PVD, PVDBO talks about your different employee benefits. So if there is new service, you add it. Path service, you add it. Your interest on your PVDBO balance, you add it. Actuarial loss is added also because this presents an increase in the obligation. Actuarial gain decreases your present value of defined benefit obligation because your obligation decreases in an actuarial gain. Benefits paid, of course, decreases your liability because this shows the amount of your liability settled. Benefits paid, this talks about your settled liability. After that, we have your ending balance, okay? PVDBO. Just know the items of PVDBO, current service costs, past service costs, interest costs, actuarial gains and losses, and then your benefits paid. And determine what part of our T account should we include those items. Next, we have your fair value of plan assets. So under your fair value of plan assets, first we have your actual return on plan assets. If we have your PVDBO, which is the interest on your plan assets, uh, which is the interest on your defined benefit obligation, your actual return on plan assets is also known as your interest or your gain on your plan assets. So whatever is the interest earned on your plan assets, we also place it. Next, we have your contributions. Of course, if you have contributions on your plan, it will increase your plan assets. And once you pay, it will decrease your plan assets. So what are the items of plan assets? Only these four items. Your beginning balance of plan assets and any return on plan assets or income on plan assets. Generally, this is your interest income on plan assets. Then... Any contributions to the plan should also be added. But if you pay your liability, this will decrease your plan. Again, we just need to compare PVDBO to your fair value of plan assets. If PDV, PVDBO is greater than FVPA, we have a deficit. If PVDBO is less than FVPA, then we have a surplus. That's the first step. Next, we go to step two. What is this step two? Determine the net defined asset or net defined liability. So how do we determine the net defined asset or net defined liability? So based on your step one, if you determine we have a deficit, that is net defined liability. Okay? Deficit pertains to net defined liability, while surplus pertains to net defined asset. Now, under your surplus, this is the lower between the surplus and asset ceiling so that we get for your net defined asset. So what is your asset ceiling? Your asset ceiling is the amount of your future refunds out of the plan. So normally, this is the present value of future refunds. So present value of your refunds on the plan is known as your asset C. So what do we mean by that? When we say it is lower, surplus, again, is the difference between your PVDBO and your fair value of plan assets, wherein your fair value of plan assets is greater than your PVDBO. When you talk about your asset ceiling, this surplus or this uh, remainder over your fair value of plan assets, we need to determine if we can still collect all of that remainder. So how much can we still collect out of that remainder or that surplus? So we need to determine that. We call that your asset ceiling. That is your amount of future refunds out of the remainder. So since it is a future refunds, generally it is known as your present value of future refunds. Okay? Since it is a future refund, again, we get for its present value. So assets, the amount of your refunds out of the remaining surplus. 
Now, take note, to get for your net defined asset, it is not this surplus. You compare, get the lower between the surplus and the asset ceiling. Okay? You get the lower between the surplus and the asset ceiling. Next, after your step two, we go with your step three. In your step three, we need to get for your net defined benefit cost. So accounting for your net defined benefit cost, step three. So the components of your defined benefit cost. First, we have your current service cost. Current service cost is placed under your service cost. Past service cost is placed under your service cost. Next, we have your gain or loss on settlement. Your gain or loss on settlement is uh, based on the amount of your defined benefit and the amount of your cash paid on your defined benefit. So let's say your defined benefit is $1 million, but you only settled it for 800000 So your liability is $1 million, but you only settled it for 800000 So do you have a gain or a loss? If your liability is greater than your cash payment, we have a gain. If it's lesser, we have a loss. So when we talk about gain or loss on settlement, we talk about the settlement amount of your defined benefit. So let's say your benefit is $1 million, but you only settled it for eight hundred. you have either gain or loss. If it's greater, the amount of benefit is greater than the cash payment, we have a gain. Because again, your liability should have been $1 million, but you only paid 800000 so the difference now is equal to your uh, gain. And how about if the def difference is that your cash payment is greater than your benefit? Then we have a loss on settlement. So current service cost, past service cost, and gain or loss on settlement gives rise to your total service cost. Next, we have your net interest cost. So what are your net interest costs? So when we talk about interest costs, this talks about your expense. A while back, we have your return on plan assets or also known as your interest income on plan asset. So this is equal to your fair value of plan assets multiplied by your interest rate. Since this is considered interest income, it will decrease your expense. Kaya negative yan. Next, we have your interest cost on obligation. Your interest cost on obligation is again equal to your PVDBO multiplied by your interest rate. So whatever is the amount of your PVDBO multiplied by your interest rate, this is your interest expense on your obligation. Next, we have your interest on the effect of your asset ceiling. So how do we compute for your interest on the effect of the asset ceiling? To compute for your interest effect on your asset ceiling, we need to get for your uh, asset ceiling less your fair val uh, less your surplus. Asset ceiling less your surplus. This is your difference multiplied by your interest rate. Okay? Interest on the effect on asset ceiling. So whatever is the remainder, remember, you can only present as net defined asset the lower between the amount. So the difference now is known as the interest on the effect of asset C. So whatever is the difference, you get an interest there. Right? So what are the items of net interest cost, interest income, interest cost, and interest on the effect on asset C? The third item, we have your remeasurements. So under remeasurements, we have the following, actuarial gains or losses. So you already know what is an actuarial gain and what is an actuarial loss depending on your benefit plan. Next, we have your difference between return on plan assets and your income. So this talks about your actual return on plan assets and then your interest income on plan assets. Whatever is their difference, we call them your difference between ROPA and income. Actual return on plan assets ROPA, return on plan assets. Next, we have your difference between effect and interest on asset ceiling. So first, we need to know the beginning difference on asset ceiling versus the ending difference on asset ceiling. So how can we get for the difference again on your asset ceiling? So first, we get for your asset ceiling less your surplus. 
So whatever is the difference is known as your difference on your asset ceiling. So ending difference is the ending difference on your surplus and asset ceiling. Beginning difference is the beginning difference on your surplus and asset ceiling. So this known is the difference between the effect of your interest on asset ceiling and the differences. Okay, so generally to compute for this one, we get first for your ending difference, less beginning difference, less your interest on asset ceiling. Then we get for your remeasurement on asset ceiling. Okay, again, to get for your difference between effect and interest on asset ceiling, first, to know the effect, you compare the beginning difference and ending difference. How do we get for your beginning and ending difference? To get for your beginning and ending difference, we just need to get for your asset ceiling and then your surplus. Their difference is known as either your ending or beginning difference. Beginning difference if at the beginning of the year, ending difference if at the end of the year. So ending difference less beginning difference. Further, your interest on the effect of asset ceiling, which is computed a while back, you also effect it here to get for your remeasurement on your asset. How do we compute on the interest on the effect of asset ceiling again? We get for your beginning difference, your asset ceiling less surplus multiplied by your interest rate. Okay, now what is important here is that these items, three items, service costs, net interest costs, and measurements will give you your total defined benefit cost. However, what we need to know here is what is the item of profit or loss and what is the item of your OCI. So what are the items of profit or loss? That is your service cost plus net interest cost. So two items of your profit or loss, service cost and net interest cost. Item of OCI, only one. That is your remeasurements. Okay? So the net remeasurements is presented in OCI, while your total service cost and total uh, net interest cost is presented in your profit or loss. Okay, so what are the three steps again? First step, determine for any deficit or surplus. How do we determine your deficit or surplus? We compare your PVDBO to your FVPA. So if PVDBO is greater than FVPA, we have a deficit. If PVDBO is lesser than FVPA, we have a surplus. After that, take note, a deficit is known as your net defined liability. But if that is a surplus, you get the lower of that surplus and the asset ceiling. And whatever is lower is known as your net defined asset. And then your last step is to compute for your defined benefit cost, which is composed of the three items. Service cost, net interest cost, and your measurements.